20 years ago, a book was released that promised to reveal the secrets behind the history of the video game industry. In fact, it promised to be the ultimate history of the video game industry. Of course, we are talking about Stephen Kent's Ultimate History of Video Games, undoubtedly the most popular book on the topic in the English language and probably the world. Did it live up to the hype? Or did the bold title write checks that the book just could not cash? Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I'm your host, Carl, and we have gathered three luminaries in the area of video game history and friends of the show to break down the good, the bad, and the ugly of this famous tome. Regular listeners will be familiar with our resident warden of the Department of Corrections and author of the History of How We Play blog, Ethan Johnson. That's welcome, me. Ethan. Yay. I'm not here to correct you today. Look at that. <laughs> I'm here to correct Stephen Kent. Oh, oh, it's going to feel good. And we're also joined by Dale, and I'm not going to kill this, I hope, Gepis. Uh Did I kill it? I you probably did. killed it. That was awesome. <laughs> awesome. The world-renowned FCC <laughs> regulation specialist. Welcome back. Hi, Carl. It's and Geddes, by the way, but for what it's worth. Geppis? Geddes. Two, just D's, Geddes. no P's. Oh, yeah, turn, turn them turn, P's upside turn down. Turn those P's upside down, yeah. <laughs> and turn them around also. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be Geppis, and that would be fun, too. But, oh, well. Geddes. All right. Uh, and the master historian himself, the man behind They Create Worlds, the podcast, and the book, now available from fine retailers everywhere, Mr. Alex Smith. Woo! Hey, Carl. Great to be back. Awesome. So, guys, we have come together here. Uh, I believe Ethan put it nicely. This is supposed to be some for to, uh, form of, uh, yes, laying in wake of Mr. Kent. Uh, so, uh, Ethan. We did uh, not execute him, by the way. Ethan, you we just. just <laughs> we are we just come, the messengers. We come not to praise Kent, but to bury him. <laughs> <laughs> so, Definitely no praise. So, Ethan, you just recently finished a uh, multi-part stream where you broke down ah, yes. all the great errors in uh, the tome. Now, did you use the latest edition, the one that's now relabeled Volume 1, or did you use an older edition of the book? There is really no difference between the reprints. As far as I know, I've looked at the... like. So, here, here, here's the, the long and short of things. So, Kent originally published... A book self-published uh, the first quarter, the first 25 years of uh, video games or something like that. Some, some kind of sub subtitle. Published that in 2000. Then it was picked up by an imprint of Random House in 2001. Slightly revised. A couple errors had been fixed. Um, and then shipped out. Then it was reprinted in 2010. So that was like that was the next edition, basically. Well, you know, it was reprinted. As far as I know, I've looked at it. I can't see any difference there. So that was just a reprint. And then, as far as I know, the thing that is now titled Volume One is also just a reprint. Nothing has been changed. So I just I read what the ebook version that was available, which I'm pretty sure is just the 2010 version, which is just the 2001. Okay. So, with that being said, who would like to get this sh something show going? <laughs> I, I guess I can do that. So, first of all, we do all understand that Stephen Kent was writing at a time when nobody, really nobody, had attempted to quantify yet this history of video games. There had been a few books in the early 1980s that were written by journalists that were kind of combinations Here's some things that happened in video game history. And also, here's how you win at Pac-Man. Because that's how they were trying to get into the audience, is that they were doing a combination of the two. Uh, and then you did have Leonard Herman, uh, who in the mid-90s had already uh, written... Good old Lenny. The, yes, good old Lenny, uh, who had written uh, the first edition of Phoenix. But Phoenix is not a true history trying to kind of encapsulate the industry. It's more a year-by-year -year report of... These pieces of hardware came out in these years. That's that's really what it is. It's a different beast. So we're going to be saying a lot of things about Kent that vex us and exasperate us as this podcast goes on. But <laughs> I, so I do want to take the moment up front to say that he was the first to really try to do this. 
he did some great interviews. He did some half decent research and all of us that are doing this today owe something of a debt to him. He is for just about all of us, either the very first or one of the very first books we read on the history of the industry and inspired us, at least inspired me to want to dig deeper. So I, I want to get all of that on there out there to start us off before we start tearing it apart, because he does deserve credit for what he accomplished in that sense. And I don't think he ever went about it in a way to try and mess things up. He was trying mm -hmm. his best. Um, it's just, there, there's things about his methodology that it, like really drags it down as something that we can recommend today. Okay. It, Exactly. So the main reason why I feel like we need to come together and, and do something like this, piggybacking on what Ethan said, is that it was OK in its time for what it was, which was a series of stories about the history of the industry collected by a journalist and shared with the public at a time when most of those stories had never been told before in an easily accessible medium. Unfortunately, what's happened in the years since, because it has been in print for so long and because it is so reasonably priced, it has become the de facto standard in video game history. It's the book that much of Wikipedia's content is based on. It is a book that is taught in entry-level college courses. It is a book that has attained a level of legitimacy and a aura of a foundational text that is really not deserved and therefore at this point is doing a lot of harm in terms of the discourse around video game history. Well, then that sounds like a wonderful segue to error number one. Where do we want to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not going to go down the whole list of errors because that's 30 something pages. You don't, you don't even know how many I... errors. You haven't even counted the errors. We, <laughs> nope, we, wouldn't, uh... we wouldn't have to build just a new wing of the Department of Corrections or a new <laughs> building of the Department of Corrections. We would have to build a whole new campus for the Department of Corrections if we took that approach. There, are pro there, there must be a thousand legitimate concerns brought up. Begin with number one. What was the number one? What was number one? Oh, how far did he go in the book? Like it, it wasn't like in the pages in. It wasn't something like that, but it was like it was pretty much the first. Um, <laughs> as, as soon as we get into the actual tech, again, not gonna go by this systematically. I am going to uh, clean up what I did, and I'm I'm also sorting them into types of errors as well. So some of these are just not that big a deal, though they should have been spotted by an editor. Stuff like. Uh, spellings that are literally just inconsistent throughout the book uh, or you know if, if an interviewee says something wrong like you know that's not really Kent's fault but like you know it's something you should vet if you're if you're really trying to get things right like this there's a lot of wrong dates tons of wrong years like we we have spotted so many of those and those are a bit more severe but then there and then there's stuff like interpretation uh, where he takes uh, facts that he has and looks at them a certain way, which is not how we would look at things nowadays. And then there are just errors. And and, and I, I should also point out that that when we did this exercise, we are pretty darn knowledgeable on video game history. So 90% of what we did was just going off of our own memory. We weren't even like going and vetting and going deep into sources to find additional errors, which are probably in there, because on the few cases where we did decide to Google something that was outside our realm of immediate knowledge, we found errors. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> that that uh, that we wouldn't have known. So there's probably even more than than we caught. And again, it's a product of its time, and that's okay. But the problem is this: this is the book that is taught in college classrooms. And that, to me, is a little bit disturbing. If we are to have a video game studies to understand history, this is not the place to go. I, I've, I've kind of summed up everything about this. It is very important to read if you are interested in the historical discussion around video games. But if you want to know the history of video games, Stephen Kent is not the place to go. Okay, so... Good opening salvo. 
You still haven't answered my question. What is error number one? <laughs> uh, well, I, I started reorganizing what I started reorganizing them into categories, so I no longer have them in chronological order. And this um, is why people should use spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get these out, man. Come on. It would have been a better I, idea I think from was, the outset, okay. to be honest. I, will, so, uh, I, I do remember what it was now, now that I'm looking at it. And uh, the, the, the first thing that I noticed, and this is something from an interviewee, but it's a thing about accreditation. That's another section that I have on here. Thing Like, Kent will often say, this person did, you know, did this. Like, you know. Nolan Bushnell created the VCS. I don't think he says that specifically, but, you know, something like that. Um, but that is – he's overstating credit uh, of something, trying to embody a company inside a person, and that's dangerous in a lot of ways. Um, in this case, uh, the, the first thing that I saw was actually in the – like, in the opening bits where – uh, that he got some people from the industry to, like, you know, say some praise about the book. Uh, it had – the um, – the opening uh, introduction is by Peter Molyneux, actually, which is a, pretty interesting because he was not that famous at the time. Uh, so, like, that was more one that actually kind of grew up with the time. Nor, nor is he even featured in the book because the book does not cover PC gaming hardly at all. So yeah. he's not even in the book except for the introduction. Wait, is this the introduduction of the 2000 edition? To, uh, it's the preface of, mm -hmm. of the uh, 2000 volume edition. Volume. 2001, but yeah. Yeah, to, uh, okay, 2001. I don't know uh, if it was in the it's first It's not the quarter. original, okay. But Peter Molyneux was pretty big by 2000, if you were at least coming from the PC realm. I mean, come yeah, on. But he, he really doesn't cover it. But anyways, the, okay. so the, the first thing that I, that I spotted in the book is actually Mark Cherney, who have, is, of course, just this legend in the industry, been in it for like, for 40 years, I think. Like, at this point, I think he's either going on 39 or 40 uh, yeah. at this 80, point. 82, so this will be his... 40th, 40th year, right? year in the industry. Absolute legend. One of the things he claims credit for is being a co-creator of Crash Bandicoot. That's put in his little thing. Yeah, that, uh, that's not Mark Cherney taking credit for that. That's No, he does. Oh, he, he does? does yeah, this is... I, I actually talked with um, uh, Jacob Salas, who has done a, a thing about um, uh, Universal's involvement in the video game industry. Uh, J-Rod, you might know him as... Uh, he and he has talked to Cherney. Cherney does specifically say he is a co-creator of Crash Bandicoot. He okay. was basically like, as far as I know, he was basically he was the head of the studio that published Crash Bandicoot, and no doubt he had some connection with with Naughty Dog and whatnot. He helped them uh, technically because he's just a freaking genius, you know. Like he he doesn't need this on his on his resume, but he claims to be a co-creator of Crash Bandicoot, even though he did nothing with design conceptualization or anything like that. okay that yeah that's that's a weird credit huh maybe it was co-creator in the sense that he's the one who greenlit the project and without his okay it would never have happened you know you could claim that but it's like co a creator is 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 one thing i mean i don't like to use that term in general you know ju just as kent you know, heaps stuff onto people that he's trying to encapsulate a company with. I, uh, if, if there's like five people working on a team, I don't really use the term. Like, I don't say the designer is the creator. That's just not the way that I look at it. But mm. that's my, that's my own perspective as someone who has actually created games, you know? Yeah. I'm, yeah, I guess, I guess it's one of those issues of probably storytelling at this point. Ken's background at this point and his career is more as a journalist, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Entirely, yeah. yes. Yeah, so he's trying to tell a story. I, I, I have a friend of mine who's a journalist, and I've had this discussion with him a thousand times about, you know, how what where's the line between accuracy and engagement with the with the reader? So yeah, five they, minutes before your deadline. <laughs> <laughs> As a, as a journalist, and that is, I mean, that's that that's mm -hmm. kind of where we give him that uh, that license because it's the first draft of history. And to be fair, he did draft it first, but the 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 approach is strictly journalistic, not from a historian's point of view. I will say, you know, you say that you cut down the stuff to tell a story, but 
Kent loves going off on tangent. He, like, there's just sections in the text that go absolutely nowhere. He has things that he likes, and he wants to put them in his ultimate history. Now, to be fair, the <laughs> ultimate history title was not his idea. It was the publisher's. That was not, and he very, like, strongly says that at the beginning of Volume 2, which I did buy. So I do... I can say that I'm supporting <laughs> supporting creating. Uh, yeah, he he doesn't like oh, that the title. Is a thick... It's yeah. like uh, six hundred pages. Uh, Alex read it. Uh, yeah, yeah though I though mine is with, with mine's index. the ebook. Mine's the ebook, so I, okay. I had not seen a physical copy until this moment. Yeah, so <laughs> six hundred pages, which is about imagined. what the original, the uh, you know now called volume one was. It's a different form. Like I mean, the original printing is a different form factor. It's like this big, so I don't know if the volume one is different. So these are big books. They cover a lot of stuff. Um, they don't cover some things you would think they do. Uh, one, of, one of the notable examples that is in every uh, video game history book nowadays that he puts in a footnote is uh, William Higginbotham. Now, uh, for those listeners not familiar with it, could you please expand on that? Tell okay. us about Willie H., <laughs> Mr. Mr. Uh, the uh, the wonderful Willie from uh, Brookhaven. Um, Willie Higginbotham was a uh, nuclear physicist who uh, uh, had helped on the Manhattan Project. Uh, he joined uh, Brookhaven uh, National Lab- Laboratory in uh, New York State uh, to find peaceful uses of atomic energy. And uh, they had these showcases every year where people would come in, look at the new technology. He wanted to engage them, so he used this analog computer to create a uh, tennis game um and it it was called computer tennis it is retroactively called tennis for two that was not a name he used at the time whatsoever uh but uh, that's what people know it as um and kent knows about it uh but he decides not to actually like do a, a section on it um I it's it's not it's a, it's not in video invaders I, so i'm not sure who like really first put it into a video game history book maybe like maybe um game over has it uh has a section on it I'm, yeah remember. i'm i'm not sure when it came into book form the reason that it entered the the public consciousness at all is because david all the founder yeah. of creative computing had actually played it as a high school student at brookhaven and so uh, he sent uh some of his people from creative computing to interview higginbotham in the early 1980s yeah Kent 1982 probably, yeah, Kent, as much as anything, probably didn't uh, include it because uh, Willie Higginbotham was dead by the time he was doing his research. And one thing about Kent, which is both a strength and a weakness, is that most of what is in there is based on firsthand accounts, on interviews with people uh, that were involved in this history, which are represented uh, largely through uh, these pretty epic block quotes uh, within the text of the work. This is the main thing that makes uh, it so popular. It's such, such so good as a popular history um, because text is kind of delineated into very short paragraphs, very not often very long, and then these uh, bl- so a block quote is where the, it's segmented out, so it's in its own block, and then it has you know it has uh, two quotation marks at the beginning of the end and the name of the speaker, and then it has the full extent of the quote that he's going to give you. And so it breaks up the text. So you're not reading like uh, on and on and then the quote is integrated into the text. Well, sometimes it is. There's a lot of inconsistency throughout throughout the book. Um but it like re- like it really splits everything up. There are basically no long sections in this book because of the block quote. What percentage do you think the block quotes make of the book about a quarter? Maybe more? No, definitely no, not that much. No, uh, okay. I would say more like a tenth. Okay. It feels but they do like they're more. They, I know they're persi- they're everywhere. Mm. Yeah. It's almost if it were a picture book, the block quote it provides the same form as the relief of the picture to the child. So like, here is a block quote. <laughs> <laughs> you right. even read this dense text. Here is a first hand account and it's now, in, now, to be it's fair, these places. can be used really well. Like one of my one of my favorite uh history books uh that I've read, you know, more more of a biography. Uh, history book is um, Mark Lewison's Tune In, which is about uh, the well, Tune In Volume One uh, about the Beatles, and he uses block quotes, but he really uses them in this very striking way to like really put you in the moment. Uh, 
change. Since it's more information is coming from the quotes, not color, it's not so much putting you in the moment. It's more trying to feed you the information through the words of these people. And sometimes the personalities come through and sometimes they're just, you, you can't really gauge anything from it. Especially since the book starts uh, as it gets further along to kind of confuse quotes that were given as part of retrospective interviews for the purposes of writing this book and quotes that were given to Kent in his capacity as a journalist from video game company execs that were doing their PR at events like uh, CES or E3 or other press meetups. Uh, the the book is definitely stronger uh, even with the inaccuracies in the early parts, because you do get more flavor on something like Atari when you have people like Nolan Bushnell and Al Alcorn discussing what it was like to work there. Uh, the block quotes later on in the book are mostly from present executives giving present marketing spin information, like Tom Kalinske when he was still at Sega, Kaz Harai when he was still at Sony, etc. And he doesn't treat these any differently. He doesn't indicate that these were press quotes. And a press quote is a very different beast than a historical quote. Both have an agenda, because certainly people have agendas when they are helping shape how they are remembered by history as well. But there's nothing really honest about a press quote. A press quote is about this is the information we want people to have and believe about our product. And this is what we're giving you, whether it's whether it's completely accurate or not. And and so that's something that harms the later stages of the book a whole lot, I think. And they all feel contemporary. Nothing is distinguished in terms of it's all in the now, which mm -hmm. makes sense. It's following the timeline narrative. But as you suggest that there was something about those early interviews with Alcorn Bushnell that are not there in the mm -hmm. I mean, some some of the block quotes later feel like they may have been taken from press releases. Mm -hmm. They were. They, they were, were absolutely. Oh, they were they actually peeled. There must have and, been one or two of press room. And, and he never distinguishes that for the reader. And it's very important when you're writing a work of history. I mean, you don't have to stick 2000 footnotes in a work of popular history because mm -hmm. you're aiming that book at an audience that doesn't want to read 2000 footnotes. That's not what they've come for. But you do need to be honest about where your information is coming from so that it can be evaluated. So you would say something like Kaz Harai in his E3 press conference said, and then block quote. So people know that that or at is the very a least, promotional put, press quote. At the very least, put uh, a year on it, you yeah. know, because that will at least help put us where, you Contact. know, in, 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 in the spot. Too. Yeah. There's, there's not a, there's not a citation on a single one of those block quotes. They are all assumed to be that sort of. Except I spoke if to. they are drawn from um, a textual source. Right. Uh, oh, okay. For for instance, in the chapter covering the 1993 Senate hearing, he uh, does cite that it comes from this page on the actual okay. thing of the Senate. So. <laughs> right. That's the one. <laughs> now, do you guys feel that this is a mistake? of him being a journalist and it not being part of his normal writing DNA to be thinking in those terms because he's not a historian? Or do you think that there's also a desire on his part to also include as much contemporary information as possible, similar to those books from the 80s where they were selling you the history together with the how to win the game that's currently popular, <laughs> uh, that – he also wants to be current to grab that part of that segment of the audience as well. The ones that want to hear about the latest stuff or at least the stuff from the last year or two. I, I do think that it's the journalistic impulse to tell a clear narrative. And with that period of history, which wasn't history at the time he was writing it, I mean, because mm -hmm. he takes it right up to the edge of when he's publishing. I believe he felt that this was the only way to get quotes from these people about this period into the book, which I don't think is an invalid impulse. It's just, as I said, it comes down to the needing to know the sources better. It's, it's more authoritative when someone is, hopefully, 
being honest about the choices they made in the past when they no longer have to worry about stock price or offending coworkers that are still in the industry, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it, it, it's, it's kind of surprising some of the things that he's allowed to print. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, you know, those those are more authentic than when you are just quoting what somebody said in a press conference, because there is so much inauthenticity in that, even though there is still truth to be found in that. It is a far more inauthentic thing, and it's okay to use both, but they need to be distinguished. Though, this this is the problem with the late part of the book, but the problem with the early part of the book comes from the interviews as well, because he interviewed an impressive array of people for the time when really no one had been interviewed from a historical retrospective uh, kind of perspective before. But he didn't interview that many people. You know, he interviewed two or three or four from Atari and two or three from Nintendo and actually a lot more from Sega, probably five or six or seven from <laughs> Sega. But these voices are the voices that shape the entire narrative. And he wants there to be a clear narrative. So there is an inherent bias in the way the story is told that is shaped by the sources he was able to interview, uh, both a bias based on deliberate shaping of the narrative and just because it's been at that point 20 or 25 years for some of these people, and, and memory is a funny thing. And I, I'd like to give one example of this that, that's, that's not uh, the person deliberately trying to manipulate, but to give an example of the danger of Kent and how it's permeated the, the culture, because we haven't really dealt in those concretes yet. Mm. Uh, this is one I brought up on my podcast before, so this is one that will be familiar to some people, but it has been gospel gospel truth ever since the Ultimate History of Video Games came out, that Atari manufactured millions more Pac-Mans <sighs> for the 2600 PCS cartridges <laughs> than not only than that they sold, but that there were VCSs out in the world. The story from Kent is that there were 10 million VCSs in the world, and Atari manufactured 12 million Pac-Mans. <laughs> and you can you can see in the text where he got this, because there's a block quote with Ray Kassar, who was the CEO of Atari at the time, where he says, you know, we get all this flack. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but I could get the book and give the actual quote. But, <laughs> you know, we get all this flack, but we shipped 12 million Pac-Mans. That was amazing. So this is Ray Kassar saying 20 years, 15, 20 years after the fact, without any sales material. He doesn't have documents in front of him. He's not looking at an old uh, sales sheet from Atari saying uh, 12 million as if it's a definitive thing when really, let's be honest, he, he doesn't remember what the exact number is uh, because it's been 20 years and he doesn't have a document and, and numbers all blur together. So we he have throws a out that now. <laughs> <laughs> right. We do now. Uh, so he throws out that figure 12 million. Kent, and he actually gets this kind of right, because he did do a little bit of research into magazines and, and business journals and whatnot. Kent discovers that about 7 million Pac-Man cartridges were sold. So Kent does the math. 12 million, which Kassar says, minus 7 million equals 6 million unsold Pac-Man cartridges. Five. Which is, five. yeah, five. Sorry, five. I mean, if I You've could do math this several times, by the way, if, uh, you know, if I, could, easy. if I could easy, if I could do then, math, if I could do math, I would be a historian. There's but, a million uh, more car Pac-Man cartridges and yes. El Magoro I, yeah, I, land. Exactly. I, I've created a new truth. Now everyone will say that. <laughs> but uh, no, no. So, yeah, seven and five. So, um, you know, so he says there were five million unsold Pac-Mans and they produced two million more than there were VCSs on the market. And that that became fact. It was in Wikipedia forever and impossible to get out because whenever you would try to take it out, someone would just say, uh, but you need a source for that. And we have a source for this, Kent. And it was just everywhere. But it's not true. We know as best we can know that it's not true. I, you know, I mean, it's, it's history, so we can't be 100 percent certain. But we do have a document now, an actual real document uh, that appears in the background of Howard Scott Warshaw's documentary Once Upon Atari, which shows net sales of VCS cartridges, uh, individual titles. The list is chopped off, so we don't have the full list, but they're in sales rank order and they're net sales, which means that if they didn't sell cartridges, it lowered the number and could even lower the number into the negatives. 
And as proof of this, E.T. is on there. And if you look at E.T. in the document, it shows 2.9 million sold in 1982 and negative 600,000 sold in 1983 because all the stories about E.T. and those returns are real. And you can see it in the document. So we know that was overproduced. That document does show Pac-Man selling like 7.7 or 7.9 or something like that. uh, 7.7 million. million And then over time gets uh, near uh, 9 billion, though we don't have the full. 9 million. Million. 9 million. million. No, not Billy. <laughs> now, <laughs> now you're doing it. This I'm is this a disaster. We have we, a disaster, uh, I say. No. But, Alex uh, is bad with arithmetic, so. and Ethan cannot be trusted with number signifiers. He's yes, off exactly. by an order of magnitude each time. Between the two uh, of I'm us. I'm just here to try and keep it q eight. Between the two of us, we've got it all covered. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's solid math. <laughs> That's I right. Swear. So... There goes our believability as far as correcting others. Okay. <laughs> hey, no way. We got so, this. But- so the numbers start out high and go higher in terms of total sales because there was not an overproduction. And I've and as supporting evidence to that, which is circumstantial, but I have talked to just about every executive at the time, the the the, the CFO, the president of the consumer division, uh, the VP of marketing, uh, the comptroller, several others, and I ask all of them. Did you guys produce, you know, more Pac-Mans than there were VCS systems? And and they're like, no. Now, obviously, their memories are also at this point 35, 40 years old. But they, all of them are like, that would be crazy. The, yeah, the census is just like we had good, we had drugs, but not drugs that good. <laughs> <laughs> right. And oh, but it became fact because Kent took his interview subject. At his word, Kassar, who's not trying to lie on this, but he's pulling a figure out years later. He takes that person at their word for one figure, graphs another figure that he found someplace else onto that, and reaches a conclusion that he then treats as fact. And then because he treats it as fact, everybody reads the book and they treat it as fact. And then people that go on Wikipedia use Kent as a source. And so then Wikipedia treats it as fact, cited fact, which makes it like sacrosanct in Wikipedia terms. You get a site on there and it's it's like exactly <laughs> choirs of angels. Yeah, Alex knows that ecosystem very well. <laughs> exactly. He had to write a book just to get over it for God's That's sake. That's right. That's right. Now <laughs> now I can be cited on Wikipedia to <laughs> help change some of this. But anyway, uh and created a long standing, oft reprinted myth. And of course the other sources don't even go to the detail he does, like having the Kassar quote. So then sources based off of Kent just say they overproduced with with no supporting. You don't even know where they got it from. Thankfully, because of the block quotes, we can figure out what Kent did. If he didn't have that Kassar block quote in there, we wouldn't know. So that's why the, the block quotes are valuable. But that's just a concrete example of how Kent for a long time distorted a key fact in, in video game history. And it is a key fact because it goes into Atari's credibility. It goes to Atari's managerial competence. It goes to why did this whole crash thing happen? And it made it very easy to say that Atari got crazy and arrogant and just started producing way too many Pac-Mans and ETs. And that crashed the whole industry, which uh, is is not true. So it it's a small thing, but it had an outsized impact. And sadly, that's not the only one from Kent. That's just one of many examples. Like I'll many give people, you another example here. How many people have we known have stumbled along suggesting casually with their observations of what they know of this from the background that that particular game Pac-Man was an atrocious failure? Right. Both yeah. commercially uh, I mean, and aesthetically. YouTube has accepted it, it as a fact. That's right. Right. Everybody it's, hated Pac-Man. Everybody um, hated Pac-Man, but somehow the thing moved nine million units. <laughs> the things that people, I'll tell you, they we've just moved nine million units of something people hate. If we could reproduce that, Atari would still be around today. That's right. <laughs> well, 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 aren't you buying their uh, their 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 NFTs? latest console? I have. Yeah, I, have I just purchased my Raiders of the Lost Ark NFT. <laughs> <laughs> There's two joysticks. All right. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you another We're example. All this of Atari now now that they own Moby Games. So you know. Oh yeah. Got to play oh nice. God, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let, I'll, I'll put on another example here. I'll, and I actually have the quote for this one. Um, so this is a this is one again that like there are a lot of facts in Kent that have been taken as that, but then there are just stuff that's just been ignored. Uh, mainly, I think because 
when it comes down to something like a database that like like that kind of immediately gives you an ability to check stuff so uh what one of the things is um it, he has pete kaufman which is actually like a what what the heck get like <laughs> he is just this super minor player in the middle of everything but he wanted someone for death race um so he talks to him about death race uh and uh pete kaufman has this quote which is uh we did a sequel, but it was really just the same game. There wasn't anything new about it. Now, what Kent takes this to mean is that there was a game called Death Race 2. Uh, he has no evidence that this game actually exists, aside from this block quote. But he prints the fact that there is a Death Race 2, and it wasn't successful. Not only is that completely unnecessary to print, because that is literally, like, the quote says exactly what you need to know. This is something that goes on throughout the book. Kent will either before or after a block quote repeat the information inside the block quote for no reason. Word count. This is something an editor should have taken care of. <laughs> it really, like... It really detracts on the on the readability of this. But anyways, uh, so he he presumes that there's something called Death Race 2. And there's not a thing called Death Race 2. But there are many games that were made with the Death Race hardware, which are basically the same game. So that is probably what Pete Kaufman means. But because Kent didn't have didn't know like all the games that Exidy put out, he couldn't have known that. But him going to the extent of saying there was a sequel, it was called Death Race 2. That is kind of irresponsible. Mostly for these guys who spent hours trying to determine for absolutely certain that in reality, there was no game named Death Race 2 in the end. That's right. Think of the future researchers. Exactly. <laughs> Will saying. no one think of the future researchers? Hours and hours of sifting through whatever primary sources in the hopes of discovering that name. That's never there. And, uh, and then, do okay. we have any idea what kind of primary sources other than the interviews he had? I mean, uh, is there any indication in the text that he had access to old play meter magazines he or something replay. like this? He does he very replay. specifically say that he was researching replay and he talks and I assume he got this directly from Eddie Adlam, who is interviewed in the book. Um I I can't remember if it, if there's who, like who is the founder and publisher of replay. Yes. For the uh, so, sorry, I forget people don't know the most in-depth <laughs> things about uh, the sources. In you guys don't know Eddie? He's Eddie! <laughs> <laughs> I, I have also talked to Eddie. He's very yeah, nice. Man. I know. <laughs> uh, uh, but, so he, uh, like, I don't know where he would have gone to get them, because especially because nowadays, uh, it's like, my library is the only one that has it. Like, and only from 1982. Um but he might have gone like to the replay offices in California. Probably um, got got that got the issues. But I mean, he's not sitting there like catalog. Okay, this game was announced here, and uh, this is an interesting quote from this, and I'm going to cite that. He he does basically he he does very very little um, citations from other publications. Or, or, blo or quotes from other publications, probably because he felt that it was a little skeevy sometimes. Like, he will he will quote a journalist's take on something, but he will not take a quote from an interview somebody else did and print it. And, and um, we, we do know, because he does occasionally cite a couple of Business Week articles, a couple of Forbes articles, a couple of Time Magazine articles. So some big national publications, uh, he was able to get in and do a little work on. Uh, he also relied very heavily on two of the only secondary sources uh, that predated him, which were Zap, The Rise and Fall of Atari, which was done in 1982. Well, 1984. It covers up to 1982, but it was copyright, I think, 1984. And uh, David Sheff's Game Over, uh, which chronicled the rise of Nintendo of America during the uh, the NES era. And we discussed this when we were reading it. There's lots, I, I having not read Game Over as thoroughly, there were lots, uh, it almost sounded like chunks of the book were a response to Game Over. Yeah, there are a couple things in there. He does do some small myth busting, like, you know, to say right. that it, it was said that this, but he doesn't say who said, <laughs> but <laughs> he, no, he will say, this is a this is a story and the, this is the, the response to that story from my version of the interest, which is, also, something that has occurred in other video game history books, but we're not talking about that one. Uh, 
<laughs> well, and that actually does bring up an interesting point because there were these a few other books, I mean, more narrow in their focus than uh, Kent's book. How would you guys say that Kent's book stacks up as far as research, as far as the uh, accuracy of the information given to its peers? Sure. Time? That's an excellent question. So – Game Over of these books is the most deeply researched because David Sheff had access to everybody at both Nintendo of America and Nintendo Japan. He interviewed Hiroshi Amauchi. He interviewed Hiroshi Amauchi's family. I mean, he was deeply embedded. There are errors in Sheff. Uh, it's hard to say well, which ones are errors of research and which ones are errors of language barrier when he's conducting interviews with some of these Japanese individuals through translators. Uh, it's not as bad, not nearly as bad on the error front as Kent. And there are huge sections of the book that can be treated uh, as truth. Uh, well, truth is not really a concept in history as fact uh, <laughs> in uh, by, by researchers today. So it's, it's definitely the most deeply zap has some problem. Now, Marty Goldberg and, and the late Kurt Vendell, uh, they uh, take uh, every opportunity to rip Zap to shreds. And I think they're a little bit unfair to it because it's not that bad. But it does suffer again from limited perspective because pretty much all of the early history of the company is told from the perspective of Nolan Bushnell. He's the prime interview subject. Uh, they did interview Steve Bristow, but he's not nearly as present a voice. And Al Alcorn was not interviewed at all, something he is still bitter about today. Because when wow. he talks about Zap, oh boy, <laughs> you can tell he is not happy they didn't get his version of events. So there's a lot of early history of the company that is distorted and missing because it was Nolan close to the events in question, spinning the narrative in a way that he wanted the narrative of Atari to be remembered. The other problem is the last part of the book is his complete speculation. And he, to his credit, admits it's his, it's his complete speculation. He does not treat it as fact. He goes off and does his complete speculation on what went wrong in 1982 with really no inside sources to guide him, either documents or interviews. So – it has a lot more problems, but there is material in there. There are nuggets of gold inst amongst that. The the other more general books from that period, like Video Invaders, they're they're better than you would think. They yeah. again they again suffer from a limited perspective because of course they're written right in the thick of all of this, and even the participants in it don't necessarily know what the narrative should be at that point because they're living it. Yeah, the, the, the thing about, I would say, like, vi Video Invaders and, you know, especially um, Winner's Book of Video Games it barely has a narrative at all. I mean, it, they really don't have narratives. They, they, they're not trying to tell this overarching story of, of video games. Kent is drawing the majority of his perspective on what is the story of video games, I think, from from uh hackers actually mm, uh yeah. he does he does reference hackers um and that kind of tells a story like it's renegades and technological innovation that is the story of video games and the counterculture yes Don't and the, the counterculture uh, yeah but that is less in kent than <laughs> well not yeah not in kent that's in hackers yeah. <laughs> yeah, so i think that did. that's Kent can't purge the hippie smell. There's no hippie smell left in Kent. <laughs> yeah. But, so I, you know, the. I mean, and don't he, forget, too, that the same people that he interviews, these primary sources, these Al Alcorns, Bushnells, are the same, and Kalinskis, are the same people who, even though it's back in 2000, or the research is even being conducted in the late 90s, those interviews are probably being done 96, 97, 98, conglomerated. Yeah. These are the same people who will encapsulate retro gaming history and they'll be the ones that will always be there for quotes in 2003 and 2005 to think of the number of if we could have some kind of graph to show us bushnell interviews i mean they've always he's always been there to set the record straight for what he wants the record straight for but that's what kent picks up on is he's carrying I mean, on it's those because of this these guys well yeah no and that's that's yeah. actually a fantastic point because it, it's not just 
that the people that uh, it's it's just like Dale said, it's not just the people that Kent interviewed that shaped the narrative of Kent, because then that those were the names that everybody else knew. Those were the names that other journalists and other enthusiasts would return to time and again and interview over and over and over again to get those same stories and perpetuate those same stories. Something Ethan and myself have both been very passionate about is doing oral histories with the people that have not been interviewed 50 million times. And we've done a lot of those kinds of interviews with developers and executives to get new perspectives. Kent also kind of ossified which perspectives would continue to be propagated as the years went on well, as well. I was at that the University sense. of Utah, right? <laughs> We're not, well, we'll get into that. Uh, <laughs> no, but again, it's it's part and parcel of. You know. And you know, I think I think the thing is that you know, as we found success in this period where we can find and call up anybody, you know, they and I, I think that would have been true for Kent if he wanted to contact somebody. He probably would have got that. I mean, there are some obscure gets in here. There are some people who have never been interviewed after Kent, um, but. The the people that he got were people who were very like very press familiar. Um, even the obscure people they they have more of that personality where they would have to where they felt comfortable engaging with the press. Uh, not everybody has that, and you need to work those perspectives in too. You know, so many of these engineers, you know, the the couple of like real game creators that he gets are people who have, like, like, a lot of them uh, appeared in, like, uh, High Score on, on Netflix and stuff, you know, like Okamoto and, and stuff like that, the, even though they are not the primary game creator of of the games that they are talking about. I mean, there are a couple. But, but, but Kent tells me that Okamoto created Street Fighter 2, Ethan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. That, that, that's another accreditation. But, like, Ed Logg. Ed Logg. It's a group you know, of lies. <laughs> Ed Logg, fantastic guy. Uh, and he did create a lot of interesting things, but uh, there are a lot of Atari games that get uh, basically no no coverage. That they just say they that they exist, and then he and unless Kent kind of has a personal passion to do them, like he gets Dave Toyer for Tempest. Tempest is like not really that important a game, but he really wanted to talk about Tempest, so he got Dave Toyer. But like. And, yeah. you just don't and, and the thing numbers. you <laughs> and, and the thing you say about the, the people that are good with the press, I mean, that's that's another thing. Kent being in the press, I think, was also comfortable talking to people who were comfortable talking to the press. And, and those people have their narratives set and ready to go. And uh, another example, uh, an example I often use of that is Trip Hawkins. Now, <laughs> I, I want to say Trip Hawkins is wonderfully accessible. I mean, wonderfully accessible. If you want to talk video game history, he will talk video game history. I interviewed him twice. Both interviews were like two hours long. And, and he will talk and he will give his perspective. But his perspective has been his perspective from the beginning. If you start out your interview with Trip with, so Trip, before we get started, what did you have for breakfast this morning? His answer will be, so in 1975, I had this idea that by 1982, computers would be widespread enough that there could be a computer game company. <laughs> Uh, you know, two I mean, and a half hours <laughs> later, eggs. That's that's and and I love I love Trip. He he is he is great about being accessible. So I don't want to to badmouth him. I'm just saying he has his narrative established, and Kent is not going to be the person that is going to punch through that narrative. And I mean, I'm I'm not you know I'm not a, a truly professional interviewer. So I mean, I'm not saying I really managed to, to puncture Tripp's narrative in a couple of places I did, but but not often because he's very good. I'm, I'm not saying I'm any better at it, but Kent was never going to be the person to dig deeper on these media savvy individuals that have their preformed narratives for the press all set and ready to go. He's not going to probe. He's not going to find deeper truths. And, and that's one not of the problems, problems, just to clarify, that's not a malicious misremembering of past details that's someone oh, no. who went through something and decades later has recounted it to friends family other journalists as we all in the in the statement we always make is the more you reinforce the more you tell that previous story 
the more that becomes ossified as the and, reality and, that you know, existed. In that particular, in that yeah. particular case, I have li- I literally was just looking at a 1983 interview where he is already do- doing Says, this. So yes, exactly. It, it's still a truth, but like you know, it. I probably because I was in newspapers.com the other day. I probably saw that same interview. Yeah. <laughs> it was from 1983, and he's already saying in 1983. In 1975, I realized that by 1982. <laughs> yeah. And so 17 years later, after repeating that over and yeah. over and over, right. no, it certainly Trip, it's become gospel. Can Trip, it? Yeah, Trip, Trip tells his truth. He's not sitting there trying to lie about his past. Trip tells his truth, but his truth is already established, and, and Kent doesn't probe deeper on those. And, and so that's the, that's another reason that he he spreads myths. But the, the bigger problem with that is when they get to speak for other people. They get to give perspectives on people that Kent is not going to talk to. I mean, probably the most, the the biggest example of this, even though it's not like a huge thing in the book, is Ted Dabney. Um, From from Nolan Bushnell's perspective, he could have gone out and found Ted Dabney. Uh, He wasn't like completely off the map or anything. Uh, I mean, it took, it took, it took uh, an extra 10 years for people to find Ted Dabney. Um, for Leonard Herman, credit where credit is yeah. due. For Leonard Herman to find him. Yeah, for pe- people who helped Leonard. I, I, this is the thing. I, I talked yeah, to sure. the person who gave uh, Leonard Herman the the uh, the phone number for Dabney. Fair, um, fair. That's fair. But uh, yeah, so when Leonard Herman finally pu- finally published. Uh, but like, you know, he gets to speak for him and Tripp gets to speak for other electronic arts employees who are not uh, going to be talked to. Uh, so, the, I mean, it's a very hierarchical thing if you want to look at it in those terms where the people who have the uh the greater potential to shape the narrative do do often do that and, and like some sometimes in this book some people are kind of bad mouthed about about stuff and they don't have a chance to respond there there's not a lot of conversation in the book not a lot of examination kent really does try and treat everything like fa- fact rather than truth. Now, there's the research doesn't go deep enough to reveal many conflicts either. So what is presented as a narrative from a single individual is rarely conflicted by someone else's telling of a story. We just don't go that deep in it. So that makes it easier to not have to worry about some of the conflicts that we later run into when you do hear Ted Dabney, the story, you go, wait, a, whoa. Now, a uh, quick question here, because we the question of who was accessible and what the sources were. We are talking late '90s here. This is really before everybody's got an email address, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. He, he would have really benefited from LinkedIn. I don't know why he didn't use LinkedIn, Carl. <laughs> yeah, really. I, <laughs> Kant's major downfall was an inability to recognize LinkedIn early on. So, I'm sorry. so you now, you do have a point there about the internet, but on the other hand, this was a period of time when people were not protecting their information nearly so much because the internet did not make their information all pervasive. So you want to find all of the primary movers and shakers in the video game industry in that time period? Go to go to Silicon Valley. Go to the libraries in every community. Get the city directories out and just look up Nolan Bushnell and his phone number and address are going to be there. Look up Al Alcorn. His phone number and address are going to be there. It's it's all going to be there. And Kent did research locally. So, I mean, he could have done that. And that's probably what he, he may even be what he did to find some of these people. But that's that's how you could do it back then, because the city directory is going to have everybody's address and phone number, because since people weren't bothered so much in the pre-Internet days, there was a lot less concern about data privacy since it was all analog. You had to, it was the sweat equity needed to actually get there that protected you. So somebody was like, you're at your home address and phone number. Yeah, that goes in the directory. Yeah, so it's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that, like, he should have been working on this forever or whatever. But, you know, this was an extension of the things he was doing in the press. Right. And it, and as an American game journalist, that is the perspective that goes into these books. He does very occasionally have the opportunity to talk with people in Japan, uh, only like the highest level people like uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, uh, uh, o- Okamoto, Yuji Naka. Um, Masaya Nakamura. Yeah, Masaya Nakamura, D- uh, Dave Rosen too, which is like that's probably the best interview in the book. Uh, th- uh, so he, he he's able to peer into those worlds, but he does not understand. Um, like, like, you know, there's st- like space invaders. There's like, I, I is, if 
someone here in Nishikado's name is mentioned, it's only in passing. Well, uh, and and his his story for the origin of Space Invaders is completely wrong. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and and we know and he doesn't he doesn't attribute it, but we know because of other interviews done by Ethan and, and by Keith Smith, no relation, uh, that Keith Egging is the one that told the story, who was a Taito America employee, told this story that Space Invaders started as a hexadecimal test for programmers, which yeah. is completely wrong. But Kent not only quotes, uh, cites that as fact in the book, but he doesn't cite the source. We know he interviewed Keith Egging because there are other block quotes from Egging in the book, but he did not actually cite to Egging for that fact. We only know this because Egging has given other interviews to other people later, and he told the same story, and we know he talked to Kent because there are other block quotes by him in the book. That's the only way we could piece that together. But yeah, no one from Japan, Nishikado, didn't provide input on what the inspiration for Space Invaders was, and, and that hexadecimal programmer test was completely wrong. Not even. I, I think what he was, you know, I think what he was extrapolating from that, you know, that's what he believes. Uh, you know, again, that's not him trying to distort the perspective. He's not right. trying to say anything bad about the J Japanese engineers or anything like that. Um, well, it was uh, unfortunately passed. Um, but he, I think, what he was thinking is that this guy who was doing this had never programmed before. And, and, you know, this is how I think it came down to, you know, th again, we, we have to reconstruct this because it's like, you know, this is the thing about history is that you, you're given you're given tales and then you have to understand how these tales come to be. So uh, Nishikado had never done a uh, program before and it was written in hex. We like the code. Like, he has shown the code. Um, and so, you know, th this was his first real program in hex. And so it was a test. Of whether or not you know microprocessors were kind of like the the future of it. Um, so his perspective on Japan is very limited. His perspective on Britain is even more limited. Britain and Europe, uh, basically, Europe does not exist in this book except for like rare. I think he mentions like software creations. Um, and don't forget, Peter Molyneux wrote yeah, the preface. Peter Molyneux is <laughs> he's in the preface, but he doesn't talk about any of his games. Well, I know, but I mean, he he must exist in Kent's world because he wrote the preface. That's my only point. He's not covered it's in the in book. the universe. <laughs> right. I, I, I'll give another uh, uh, one of the examples of how he just kind of mi misconstrues quotes. And this wasn't even a language barrier. I This was him reading a quote and misunderstanding the meaning of it. Uh, so th this is a quote from Yuji Naka. Uh, it, it's not actually about Sonic. He, he's actually talking about his capacity at the moment he was interviewed. Which in the late 90s, he, as, a, as a producer, this is what he says. Not just programming, everything. The graphics, the pictures. I'm really careful about everything. It's not exactly building the program itself that concerns me. It's the overall flow of the program. In my mind, working as a producer or director means handling all aspects of the game, including the music, graphics, pictures, and everything. That last part of the quote, Kent takes out and says that Yuji Naka, in all of his games that he did, he did all of the music, graphics, and code. Now, thankfully, I have never seen this repeated anywhere. <laughs> Some but, things are so ridiculous that even the original readers cannot take it at face value. Yeah, so I, th I think that the, the real story started coming out soon enough after this book that nobody was taking this as fact. But this is an example of him, like, we can see what the quote that he has given. And this is where probably all the extent of his information comes from. And he has, he has looked at it and he has taken the wrong impression from it entirely. He did not see this as, I am careful about the things that I do in my capacity as a producer and director here in the late 90s. He took it as, when I made games, I did everything. When I like single-handedly created Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, back in. <laughs> he literally, that's literally what he says. Now, I, I, I guess I have to ask this. I, obviously, Kent is working as a games journalist. This is how he's getting a, all these press releases and all this other stuff and collecting this information over over years. But do you have the impression from uh, the way he's putting the information together that he's approaching the work as a passion project, as this is something that I – 
I'm a gamer and I want to share my love of this with the world? Or is this more a feeling of I have all this material. How can I turn it into a product? Can't it be both? Yeah. <laughs> OK. And how would you divvy that up? How much? I can feel some of this because I've been fascinated by the fact that he he did make it a vanity publication. I mean, I'm assuming that that a chunk of this you get the sense is the work here is already done. A third of this is now in the can in terms of my interviews, in terms of this. I have a number of, uh, of columns that I've written on the subject. How can I reformulate this to become a book? So, I mean, there had to be motivation that was driving him in terms of the passion project that led to where I'm assuming that he had tried to sell it, was rejected, and then Vanity published it. That would seem, or maybe he skipped the publishers altogether and just went Vanity. I don't know. But you get the idea. Yeah, that's where the passion comes in. But it definitely strikes me that there was backlogged work. This is already one third. The raw material is already here for me. I can reconstitute this and and derive some profit from it. Not that that's a bad thing. You got to eat, Stephen. <laughs> I mean, you know, sp I, I can speak on this specifically because I had a bunch of interviews and I published them in a book with Story Bundle. You know, that that was just, you know, so that you, you do have to commoditize the stuff if it's going to get out there. Um, I mean, I mean, you can release it for free on the internet, but, you know, you know <laughs> in terms of, you know, it, it, it does, it also gives you a, a level of credibility and you can tell people that you're researching stuff for an end product, not just as a vague historical curiosity it has helped when i've been able to tell people that i'm like like doing this for a book or something like that um but I, I mean you know he was a journalist so that that stuff was going to that specific end uh and like carl said i think the fact that he self-published it is proof that this was not just a commodity it is he wanted this to exist yeah long before the imprint came along and then validated it with a larger selection we should point out too that in the midst of our um studies our background research we discovered that uh, there was somebody else uh, <laughs> a predecessor as nuts as we were more so in fact what was his name <laughs> zoob zoob, zoob. Rest in peace, Zub. Zub <laughs> reached out to Stephen after the publication of the first quarter, I believe is how the chronology goes, and yeah. wrote an equal amount of corrections. He basically self-edited, or he, he edited Kent's copy of the book, offering him what literally hundreds of suggestions. Whether and that was from a from a, almost a and many of the suggestions editing. are the same. Like so, is it Zoo put out uh, this thing for the first quarter and he and he is thanked in in the acknowledgments uh, by Stephen Kent. He, he says of, like, of, the some, yeah. of the ultimate history of video games. He said, his, I believe his quote is something like, "There are some day, days when I cursed Zub, and then, <laughs> but uh, now I am thankful for him." Um, <laughs> but he took some of the examples that Zub gave him. And then some he just didn't. Mm -hmm. And some of those are the same that we have. Now, so, yeah, when we came yeah. across it, we were like, wait a minute. <laughs> we, we are only walking in Zub's footprints. <laughs> Why but, did the man not pay attention the first time? <laughs> but, but to circle back around, you said, uh, Kent also does briefly tell his personal gaming history at the start of the book, too. And I mean, as a student he in Hawaii, uh, that's where he grew up, he encountered Pong. And he fell in love with video games when video games were new. So there was also a passion there. It wasn't that he became a journalist and he happened to be assigned to the video game beat. And then he had to get to know these people because he was assigned to the video game beat. He fell for video games at the very beginning of video games. So there is a personal passion definitely in there. Yeah, there was no such thing as a video game be began. Mm -hmm. They were novelty stories for newspapers. Look what the kids are addicted to. He and and one one thing to note about his specific press coverage is that he was a reviewer. That was how he actually got into things. He was not actually like a, a, a pressy, you know, that that kind of press person. He was reviewing games for broader publications. He and was not David late, Chef. <laughs> yeah, and then later he got into gaming specific publications through his work. Um, and you can see a lot of the reviewer in him one of his like biggest bugaboos that i would like especially towards the end of the book that i was just like 
why do you care so much? And it is entirely because of his background is that he like he admonishes consoles that don't have enough launch title. And the reason that he does this is because a reviewer wants to have stuff to, to, to cover when a new console comes out. It's not because it, it actually says anything about the objective quality of the software. He wants to be able to have content that he can talk about. So, like, he, I, I believe that when he talks about the, the PS2, he's like, it only has 15 launch titles. Nothing before that had 15 launch titles. Barely anything today has 15 launch titles if you're talking about physically boxed new games. Like, but that is a, that is a thing for him. It is a thing that he really adheres to because that's his background. So coming back to the uh, structure of the text, the way that he is organizing all of this information, uh, just looking at that, do you believe that there's any major errors that just come from the way he's organizing it? M uh, ideas get mixed up or misconstrued, not because of the words themselves, but because of the way he's laying it out. Chronology. Yeah, it really suffers from anything. a lack of thesis. <laughs> the, yeah, there's uh, definitely, like, the, the broadest thing that I can say about the older history of video games is that saying that technology is always advancing and we're going to be getting greater things in the future. That seems to be what the thesis is, but, like, I could, like, there's no definition beyond that, as far as I can tell. It does let those. It, that's where those those narratives. That, the free form of it is where he lets the narrative get shaped when he's talking to the Bushnells and the Hawkinses. And the, there's such a lack of structure. Like you said, he loves Tempest. So when we hit Tempest, there's three pages on Tempest, and you're suddenly like, why are there three pages on Tempest? <laughs> uh, he, he he loves the Vectrix because he, uh, loves, he loves the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Uh, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> be, because there are three pages on Tempest then Tempest becomes one of the quote unquote significant games. Right. So, you know, you, you talk about it in terms of the structure because he chooses to focus on some really weird areas. And because that's the book everybody read, then the readers attach special significance to the things he decided to cover. Now, Tempest was a successful game. I mean, it did 15, 20,000 units, which was very respectable at the time. Uh, it was pioneering in the sense that it had Atari's first color vector monitor. And uh, adding color to vector is a pretty big deal because you have to have more more CRT well, guns in there. Uh, Atari's first, I said. I know. <laughs> but I'm saying I'm saying that if you're talking about it in a wider cut, if you're saying it's important because it has color vector, Right. It's not the first color vector. But, but I said it was Atari's first. I, I, I didn't say but it was I, the I, first. I, yeah, so, I, you know, it, it, was, it, it was... Slug. Ethan has a certain bugaboo <laughs> about a certain company. <laughs> and he to make sure yeah, yeah. that everybody knows somebody else first. Right. <laughs> Eliminator? What's that? Never heard of it. No. But... Uh, <laughs> but uh, the company again? Mogwai? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> so... Go. So it, it was fine, but it wasn't epoch-defining. It wasn't one of Atari's bestsellers. Atari had several games that were more best-selling. It wasn't Atari's most influential. And, as Ethan said, it wasn't even the first to do some of the things that it did early. So it's not that special in the context of video games, but I think it was elevated to a degree because it was one of the games Steve Kent decided to cover. And kind of the the reverse phenomenon of that is that Kent covers the arcades during the 70s when they're first forming and during the Golden Age, when, of course, that is the focus of uh, the video game industries as opposed to industry. Then he just doesn't talk about it again until he comes up for air on Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat. And then he never talks about it again. And this leads readers to assume that arcades hit the skids at the time of the crash and were not relevant again until Street Fighter 2 came along, which is totally not true because the the industry, you know, it bottomed out in 84, 85, and then it started rising again. And it actually had its second peak in 1989 before Street Fighter 2 came out. During the period of Street Fighter 2, Mortal Kombat, NBA Jam, Daytona, the industry became more hits driven again. So you had individual games like that that were doing numbers that had not been seen since the early 80s. But the industry as a whole had actually already peaked and was in decline again at that point. And 
people miss that narrative because they see that Kent didn't cover that and assume that the arcade just went dormant between about 1984 and 1991. Yeah, that and, you know, that's the thing about him picking up where Zap and Game Over left off. That he, that in the new directions that he gets to go because of when he's doing this stuff, he, like, there are, there are irresponsible things like that. Uh, and there are also some good things. Like him covering the, um, the night, the Senate hearings and the formation of the EASRB. Like, those are actually very crucial things that, uh, people should be talking about. But, um, you know, and that, then he puts up walls when he's talking about Nintendo. He is definitely one of these people that uh, thinks Nintendo is overreaching, and he uh, takes uh, it. He takes Sega's word that they were ahead, like in 1992, even though they weren't. Uh, and you know, they he he bring even though you know everything is perspective. He brings up errors that are very and they're, they're all press. Driven. That's that's the perspective. It is a, vi- a perspective of a video game press person. Sega was masterful with the press under Tom Galinsky. Mm. And you can tell that Kent was taken in by that, which is really, I mean, not really a, a bad thing. That's not an insult to Kent. He was a press person and, and Sega was very good at feeding him. So everyone was doing their job. But when it came time to take a step back, and do the history, you could tell that there was a lot of personal admiration for Sega and for the people at Sega whom he interacted with (laughs) professionally that was getting in the way of telling the story of Sega. And not even uh, mention that basically between Space 4 and Doom, nothing about computer games except to mention when a publisher like did or like a developer did computer games before they did console it is an extremely console focused book on every single level there is basically uh, just like everything is deference to the console industry now it do you guys have any theories on why that is why he makes that choice in the book well, sure, because, you know, Super Mario Brothers sells 40 million copies and, uh, you know, Myst sells 6 million copies and it's the best selling at that time PC game of all time. I mean, I, I do think it's it's an order of magnitude thing and it's a where he thinks the audience is kind of thing. And it's a these console company people are the people that I interacted with as a journalist. These are the big shots, the big players. These are the people that I'm I'm covering. I think it's it's probably a combination of those factors. And I think it's that thesis that I, I was talking about that thing, being, things are just getting bigger and better, and they're they're going to go into the stratosphere. And at the time, PC gaming did not seem like it was actually going to really take ahead, even on the graphical standpoint of console gaming. Right. That. You know, the P- PS2 was touted as being way more powerful than anything you get on a PC. It's only really after the initial publication of this that PC takes on its own with with uh, 3D acceleration and all that. So, l- like, as far as you look at it from the perspective of someone covering in the in the press, that this is where the majority of the audience is. It seems like everything impressive is going on on consoles. The and that's where uh, all the sales are coming from. Um, what what is the point in covering PC if that is not what you know if that's not going to be the the big the big highlight of how people play games? Absolutely. Consoles are specific to games, and where I'm telling a story which is about video games. Absolutely, you know and you know we're we're not here to talk about volume two, but he he keeps the <laughs> same track. He seems he he keeps that same track going. In volume two, and it's it's less defensible there because like console controllers to me. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Because once you get to the Xbox, once you get to the early 2000s and beyond the PC industry, the PC game industry has influenced so much more. So much of what the console industry is today really comes out of the PC industry more than it comes out of the traditional console industry. And when Kent was writing the first book. It was not apparent that that was going to happen. So it's a little bit excusable. But how he could continue that track in volume two, you cannot talk about the modern console industry and its successes and failures without talking about Doom and Quake 
and steam and all of this other stuff that has played a massive role in in how consoles have been shaped as well, but particularly through Microsoft's work with with the Xbox and the Xbox 360 and bringing more of a PC gaming sensibility into console game. Now, you guys talked uh, quite extensively about the influence Ken's book has had because it's become the textbook. Uh, would you compare this on a historical level with the famous book the Medici's printed about the Renaissance, where they focus on Florentine uh, uh, artists that they pat- uh, patronize, defining what the world thinks is the Renaissance? Uh, and that we haven't broken away from that. There are hundreds of artists who in many cases were better than the ones that were uh, supported by the Medici who have largely been forgotten except by the hardcore art connoisseurs. Do you think we can break this cycle and bring the history of gaming into a wider circle beyond basically the four of us nerds? <laughs> I, I think Bro, that's I'm glad a, that I'm glad you came yeah. up with that analogy because I was struggling <laughs> for one the other day. Dale was smiling so much. Similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know, I'm Edward like, there's going to be some what other shit history book? <laughs> yeah, no, that's <laughs> problems like this. That that is an good excellent call. analogy. Thank you. And Thank you. Thank you. you know that you know the good news is we're we're still we're still in the midst of it. The commercial video game industry at this point is only just turned fifty, and and so we we still have time. Uh, you know, we're not we're not five hundred six hundred years removed. Uh, and still <laughs> being influenced by that narrative. I, I think it can be broken. I think that there is a hunger for more from uh, an enthusiast audience. I mean, the general public, it doesn't care. They're going to go look and find the easiest, cheapest thing they can do. But I think there is more of a hunger in the, in the enthusiast audience for something better than that. And that the main obstacle right now is just that it doesn't exist yet. Because for for all of his faults, he created something that was that gave the appearance of being fairly comprehensive. It has no PC stuff and huge gaps in the arcade stuff, but, but it gives right, it gives the appearance of being comprehensive while also being easily accessible. The prose is very accessible and being cheap and available. And there really isn't much else that has done that. The closest so far is Tristan Donovan's replay, which is also pretty good at being comprehensive. I I've, I've heard complaints. I, I find it readable, but I've I've heard complaints that it's a bit less accessible than Kent from a readability perspective. I I don't really know where that comes yeah, from, that, but, that but is, I've heard it. Yeah, I, I like re- rereading this book. I was just so amazed by some of the weird things that happened in the text there are just like transitions are terrible like that that is one of the things that like on a literary perspective i think kent just completely fails that and the editor should have dragged him back on that uh but but even though the transitions are bad and i agree with you on that (laughs) they're not so bad that you lose track of where you are it's to a general audience it's still accessible yeah, and I think the the big reason for that, and I think the big reason that people don't like replay is that it, replay takes the form of a narrative. And the ultimate history of video games delineates chunks. It has ch- it has section headers, and none of those section headers are over like five pages. Right. Um. So he re- like he really breaks everything down into things you can r- read a little bit and then leave and then come back to it, and it's like you will not lose that much in terms of, of what's yeah. be, being put down. So I think that in terms of retention, Kent really has an edge. Mm-hmm. Right. And and so and and more books are being written. I mean, you know, I, I started doing this uh, you know, doing research, you know, around two thousand six. And at that time there were like six or seven books and that was the sole time of sole sum of everything. And now, you know, some years there are that many books released in a single year covering this and that individual topic. So there's been an expansion of interest in an enthusiast crowd. There's been a lot better research that's come along. Now we just need something from somebody that is distilled down into a mass market single volume in the same way that Kent is. And I think 
when that happens, the audience will go there because I, I think there's an understanding amongst most people that teach this in universities. And, you know, we, we've we've talked to some of them ourselves and, you know, they'll basically say, yeah, we can't is full of problems, but it's a single volume. It's cheap. And this is what my faculty wants me to use because this is just an introductory course for freshmen or whatever. And it's a single volume and it's cheap and it's easy for them to read. So just go with it. And, and the department doesn't really care about the nuances. These kinds of lecturers and professors will switch to something else when something else exists because they know there's a problem. Enthusiasts will switch to something else when something else exists because even if they don't know there's a problem every time, they at least know that Kent is old and something new that does the same thing may have newer information in it. So I, I think it that's the missing link. universally turn people to to. Re I know that in the past, whenever anybody's brought up the subject of this has issues, what do we? What do I do? It's been like hold your nose and go get replay. Yeah, re replay is the best right now. It has a lot going for it, but it's it's still missing. He did some. Good research, Tristan Donovan did, but it's still missing the depth of research. We need something that combines the depth of research that someone like, yes, that something like They Create Worlds <laughs> did. Ethan's holding it up, so I, feel, so I feel like I can uh, plug my own. But, you know, I, I would never recommend that book to somebody who doesn't really want to know this stuff because it's long, it's expensive, and it, it's not written in in a in an enticing narrative style it's not it's not written in an overly technical scholarly style style either but it's it's a book that's meant for people that already love this stuff um i would like the to volume take would kill a sophomore class <laughs> right you couldn't, exactly. you couldn't consume it in a semester there's too much when, when i'm when i'm done with this massive three volume thing i would like to try my hand at at a single volume history that could that could fill this gap whether whether what i write would be up to the task i mean i don't know but it, it doesn't have to be me but somebody needs to write that single volume well researched concise but still hinting at the depth below the surface kind of book. And that will move things forward. And I think there's still time for that because it is still a very young medium. So even though Kent is well-established now, we're, we're still at the very beginning. It hasn't, it doesn't have hundreds of years of credibility behind it, which is very hard to change. So what I'm hearing from all of this, what we really need, because if replay's problem is the narrative, the continuing narrative throughout uh, the piece, uh, other books like Game yeah, Over and so forth are limited. I would say it's not, it's not specifically that it's the narrative. Uh, I, I think narrative histories are the mass market histories. And that way, Kent is kind of an aberration. Like, it's like it, even though it has it's like a script. You know, a yeah, well, I, I think it's like it's exactly what you said. It's it's the it's all the subheadings. There are many individual, easily accessible narratives within the book, even if those many narratives do not always cohere to a larger narrative. The, the, I think the the problem with replay again. I don't get this. Like I read it, I think it's like a really speedy read. I I, I think it was the yeah, first, I, okay. I, it was like the second video game history book I finished. I had like read a little bit of Kent. Um, I think Power Up was the first one that I, I read all the way through. And then I read Replay and I was like, wow, this is actually like this is written so much better than these other things. But uh, I I think that it's just dense. I think that it really does pile on the these things and kind of it does expect a little bit of foreknowledge, um, especially on the computer topics for you to really understand like a computer is made up out of a microprocessor. This sort of, It's not technical, but again, I think it it does require a lot of foreknowledge. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to say that I know the best way of how to present this. Well, um, one of the things that I was thinking, because some of the books that I keep going back to on my shelf, uh, when I just want to look up some basic details about stuff, uh, is, for example, I've got a copy of Game Over. And mm -hmm. it's wonderful visual book. And the fun thing is it's broken down by games or company. And I can just look up a quick thing here. I've never read the book Front, uh, cover to cover, just because it's not that kind of book. Now, I'm thinking if we really wanted to create a textbook, those subheadings that are in uh, Ken's book, uh, if you took that to the next phase and really turned it into a textbook, you would have to just break everything down by topic, have three mm -hmm. or four well-researched pages on each topic, really 
bear down to what are the essential points to understand it. And you can always then just add a couple of extra links at the end or something to additional information. That might be the more massively acceptable uh, tome that you could actually hand then to people who want to educate others on this and also just make it sort of a um, – what's the – a reference guide. Yeah, well, there are plenty of books out there that are about – like there's game study books, game, game design books – uh, that I've read, like, and some that even include uh, historical stuff, like uh, Ernest Adams does a lot that have kind of historical sections in them, or uh, um, Bartle, Richard Bartle. Uh, you know, they will they will try to fit history inside of their textbooks while trying to teach you how to how to do this certain stuff. Yeah, definitely segmentation is one of the way to uh, delineate the more difficult aspects of this stuff. Um, but the uh, uh, but even even these books that are like really trying to be uh well bo- both the ones that are on the scholarly end like the um Mark JP Wolf series of books um which we talk about quite a bit uh and just the 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 more mass market books that are j- just like learn about video games uh they they draw on Kent that is just like the big issue <laughs> yeah Right. I mean, we, we need something, you know, I mean, at some point it would be nice if if the study of the field is is big enough to warrant real textbooks. But it it isn't yet, which is why Kent is the fallback so often. Uh, I mean, I really do think that even before you get into, you know, how do we do a textbook, we need something that is mass market, that that truly just gets people interested in the story, but interested in the story in a way that is accurate well and, it almost yeah. sounds like this would be the type of well um, spitballing ideas i know we're getting a little off topic with this <laughs> but it is fascinating me and it's kind of where my brain is going right now mm-hmm. uh, after listening to you guys talk about it this almost seems like an idea where you could really turn this into an uh an open source project to create well, I mean, this kind Wikipedia of Wikipedia exists. Work. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> but I, I'm almost thinking of Wikipedia where only people who have done the research, a separate wiki just for video <laughs> games. <laughs> oh, so, the dream. But, but, but uh, yes. the, the problem is, I mean, that's a way that you can get knowledge across. But, I mean, the reason that the most successful books in general are still not created by committee is that you need an authorial voice that goes across an entire narrative and binds a narrative together. And and when you create written projects by committee, you just don't get that. Or maybe or maybe yeah. we need to be moving to an interactive way of teaching it. So, so something along the lines of uh, games like Life of Pixel or Evoland, uh, but you know, with I, a I more thought, specific educational yeah. intent. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've thought li- about like, what if I created a game that like took people through the the stages of uh, and eras of of game development or something like that? I mean, that's it's a it's a huge project and everything. Uh, but uh, you know, but that that is a bigger thing about has education evolved to the point where people will actually like fully engage with this and want to learn with it? You know that that was that was the question being discovered in the year in the mid nineties as everyone was doing multimedia, uh, and I, I'm still not I'm still not sure what what answers came out of that. Uh, you know so that that's I a mean, different. I I yeah I mean you know my my undergrad was in history and I love history and I love reading books about history, but. You know, when it came time to read a book for an assignment, I was still like cram skimming it and cramming it like the day before class. It's it's like once it's for an assignment, you don't necessarily engage. So even if you like games and learning about game history through a game might be something you see as fun, as Ethan said, are you really going to engage with that in a classroom the setting? Only the only way, way to do you'll this actually get something out of it. <laughs> eight disc series similar to Time Zone, but based on <laughs> oh, no. Based on different fi- historic in- inflection points of history in video games, all text adventure, no graphics. Come on, no, no, no. <laughs> it's got to be time zone, which means it's got to oh, be those, okay. those yeah, raw agree. and fill okay. kind of graphics. I want to yeah. see Nakayama and his comb over rendered yeah. in oh, time yeah. zone yeah. graphics. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, we have a 
Yeah, that, that, we've got inside Al, jokes right now. Al Alcorn's daughter's bedroom be rendered over moments and the <laughs> wires everywhere. Lord. You need to help Al solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be I, a labor. I'd, be an, I'd play it, what it's worth, obviously. Uh, yeah, the, so I, I think that it really, like, okay, so fundamental question. And I'm not saying we have to answer this, but what is the story of video games? Once you work from that standpoint, I think an author can create something where at least their idea of what, of what the story is gets out there. Yeah. And it's fine to engage with something that has its own particular story. I mean, a good story has a, a direction. Like it's not going to be without any sort of, uh, you know, emotions in it or any sort of thing like that. so i think that so you know if you are going to be that person who overtakes Kent, that is your first question what is the story of video games do i have the resources in order to like properly say that this is a story that i want to tell then you go from there yeah now or maybe and this is a question to all of you do you think it's simply too big at this point for a single volume. Is it really possible to tell the story of the industry? And this is, again, another question. I mean, Alex, uh, I, I cribbed this idea from you when I was designing my show that with at, you need at least 20 years distance to be able to talk about history. Oh, so, look at what you're doing. <laughs> that's why there's no 10 year jump on the show. <laughs> uh, that was part of the original design. And then I heard you and I was like, you know, you're right. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the idea here would be if you did, let's say up to 2001. So the mm -hmm. year ultimate video game history came out. If you were going to do a new book today, covering that first 50 years, not the first quarter, the first two quarters, uh, what would it be possible to give a comprehensive look, considering that we've got to cover computers, consoles, arcades, Europe, Japan, North America? Is that a reasonable thing? So, I mean, obviously, whenever you abstract, you lose. I mean, okay. even with my giant three-volume history, if I did a 20-volume history, I could, you know— tell you what Al Alcorn had for lunch when, when he first made Pong. I mean, you know, you can always drill down more. But I think this goes back to what Ethan said. If you figure out the story of video games that you want to tell, and, and there are many stories, just because you yeah. tell you're the story of video games, that doesn't mean it's the only story of video games. If you figure out what the story of video games is that you want to tell, then you can shape a narrative that brings in all of that material in service to that story, and you have created something comprehensive to your thesis. And if that thesis is a broad enough thesis to encompass something of the history of video games, then, then I think you've succeeded in that. Will, will you have told every last story, gone down every last blind alley, told the story from every perspective it can be told? No, you won't have, but it, it may be enough. Like By definition. Exactly. Like if, if you know, I, and I'm not going to be tackling this for like five or six more years. So, I mean, I haven't really given it thought. But one of the things that I've always found fascinating is the the tension between video game as creative product and video game as commodity. And if if I were to try to tackle this single volume, I would most likely start from that perspective and about, you know, about the. The creative side uh, that's oftentimes even at the start of it done just for the fun of it, the challenge of it, the heck of it, et cetera, and then how that intersects with the business side and about how the tension between those two desires to make something new and interesting and exciting and fun and clever and something that can sell drives the uh, the industry forward a very hegelian uh, way at at looking at it i suppose um and, and i think that's one story now six years from now is that how i'll actually tell it i don't know because i haven't actually outlined this this thing but that's i think one way you could tell that story i think and that's your and that's your thesis like that's how your thesis carries throughout in the same way that hackers tells us that same story but it's from the 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 rebels the Mm -hmm. the counterculture that's the that's that thesis that runs throughout say hackers ultimate doesn't really have a thesis it barely has mm -hmm. a theme as ethan suggested in that technology is awesome 
we're growing. It's going to get bigger. <laughs> that seems to be the only glue that holds Ultimate together. Oh, and this stuff all happened. Yeah. yeah and the the best thing about video game history, I think we can all agree, is how much crossover. Like, there are just pieces, like little strands you know, these little creators become these big things at other companies. People are crisscrossing over all the time between computer co- companies, console companies, arcade companies. Uh, how it all fits together is like this fascinating thing. I think Replay does a really good job in like, mm-hmm. you know, presenting something like that. Uh, one of my, one of the best examples out of it is he has more of an international coverage because Tristan Donovan is British. So he has like a whole thing on the early British computer industry, which if you were doing a, a larger single volume, maybe you would decide that isn't really that important. But the way he kind of builds up from there to, to cover global stuff, uh, like he doesn't get everything, obviously, but he covers greater Europe, um, you know, places like Spain and the Netherlands and uh, France. And France, yeah, France has its own chapter. Uh, he uh, and when he talks about Tetris, he uses it as an as an opportunity to explore what was going on in the Soviet bloc. He builds this up. He he focuses attention in one place, and then he slowly grows it out. Um, and I'm not saying that's the the way that you need to tell the story. And I mean, you could restrict it entirely to one region if if you want. Um, and but I think that he has given a roadmap if you are somebody looking to follow within those footsteps to covering basically uh, all aspects is just you put mm-hmm. your your uh, focus in different areas. OK, so uh, with that being said, uh, you're c- we're coming back now to Kent. And I think it's at an hour 41. We're getting to the point where this is probably a good place to start to wrap it up. <laughs> um, Coming back to Kent, we what do you think had the original title the first quarter also been used for the republications of the book? Hmm. Would we still be talking about this book twenty years on? Or is there something specific about that title that was chosen by the editors that has given it the place it has today. And Dale, you had your hand up. So I you, I want to <laughs> jump on in this one. <laughs> go, go, go. Well, because I was fascinated because he, it's volume two, right, Ethan, that he then goes on a little bit about how originally I had not intended for the first volume to be the ultimate history. I thought the title somewhat, he may even call it ostentatious, but he definitely downplays this idea of authority being given to him inadvertently through the entitlement from those editors. But what I find funny is, is that he certainly, particularly since the newest volume has sort of come to fruition in the last few years, has taken all of the opportunities to position himself as that authoritative voice. <laughs> and so it's almost like, yeah, I, we get it. You, you didn't mean for it to happen, but ultimately it did happen. And now you're going to make bank on it, huh? Okay, Ultimate volume two. Day. Let's <laughs> have it. <laughs> so, but in fairness, he does down he does downplay his own authority with that idea of he never wanted it to call it particularly by that phrase alt because we, that's a that's something that you know any historian Alex we want to call your book the ultimate history you'd be like um I really would rather you didn't you're really setting you're really setting me up for problems there later on I'm sure a hundred years from now they'll be laughing at the entire thing if they can even find one (laughs) the most comprehensive history of this subject I mean if you wrote a book about if you wrote the 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 ultimate history of blank I don't care what it is you're begging for you're begging for criticism in that respect. I mean, like the first quarter is like an excellent title. Yeah, like that, that's awesome. That is, that is a wonderful title. I and you know I'm not I'm not a press person. I don't know if it would have sold under that. Um, so I don't think that by itself is really the uh the deciding factor. I, you know, I, I think it's just it's it's place. If people pick it up because it's called the ultimate history of video games, um, it, I, it doesn't matter if they critically evaluate that title or not. I think it really just depends on what they take from it. Uh, I don't yep. think that. Yeah, oh, go, go, go ahead. ahead. I would say, I mean, I agree with that. But at the same time, I do think that it it did help lead us here, because back in the day, back when it first came out and you actually went to bookstores 
to find these kind of books. And that book was sold in bookstores. And you come to the very small uh, video game section of a Barnes and Noble or a Borders, back when Borders was a thing, that mostly has strategy guides, maybe an art book or two, and then just the couple of books that have been written uh, with a more historical perspective. And you see this pretty thick book that is called The Ultimate History of Video Games. And you see how it dwarfs the other books on the shelf in that section. I think I think a prejudgment has probably occurred at that point. <laughs> you may be judging the book by its cover. <laughs> you <point>. may be. <laughs> Which is not exactly a, a favorable comparison to some people. I, I think the cover is really <laughs> Oh, the cover, the cover yeah. is amazing looking. Uh, and, uh, well, because the original book got press coverage but was self-published, I remember going to a Barnes & Noble and asking if they could get me a copy of the first quarter, and they just looked at me and was like, it wasn't even showing up in the system, I don't believe. Yeah. So uh, when that next book came out, it had such a gaudy cover, I didn't buy it for that reason. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it looked awesome with the fonts and everything, but I was like, this is kind of this is not a serious tone, you know. Right. First quarter was that blue cover with just the Pac Man and the ghosts on it, and you're thinking, okay, it's the first quarter of a century. It's a good pun. Um, I wanted that book. Ultimate. Video- I don't know. There's something about uh, video game history book covers. Replay doesn't have a good cover either. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> um, what is it, uh, we don't know who did that they create words I one score, but i hope to god they passed it through legal is all i want <laughs> i score uh originally had laura croft on the cover and then they downgraded it to uh everquest lady uh yeah. <laughs> was that right yes <laughs> that is, that is she was probably pricey to be honest back then <laughs> well because the first book didn't cover mmos at all and then the second book had a section dedicated to mmos so they were trying to show that they were hip and cool with the latest came out in 2004 and you know what came out right after that world of warcraft so miss that boat but oh well (laughs) no one knows who that everquest lady is anymore i know people still play everquest but the general public does not know who that everquest lady is anymore (laughs) just just another piece of advice if you want to be the next uh stephen kent have a good book cover Uh Uh, that, that will entice the public and show that you are serious and and have a title that you know does a good job of showing your purpose i mean i the ultimate history don't use ultimate final greatest authority you know definitive comprehensive i mean don't do that but i i do think that that those that word probably did help in that snap judgment that you make in a bookstore back in the day i, I think it would be less important now because it's what it's what's discoverable on amazon Re- you need a title and a synopsis that's discoverable on amazon uh, and is discoverable in google i mean that's really what you need today you need to be at the top of the search results this is a good title <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it tells a story. You almost could say it creates a now. Uh okay. Gentlemen, final thoughts. Dale. We're taking the three hundred and some pages of corrections that Ethan did. We're shipping it to <laughs> Kent's uh condo somewhere in God knows where, Provo, and we're nailing it to his door. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're, you're, the door is going to fall over from how many pages? We are, we are reforming. <laughs> we are reforming. We're not actually going to do that for legal purposes. <laughs> <laughs> I am in another country. <laughs> Ditto. You don't need Ditto. to come prosecuting me for these threats. <laughs> well, then here's okay. Let, I'll, let me let me spiel off my joke. What do you do with this? I know Ethan's got plans to try to revamp a bit of it. I mean, it was a labor of love. It was about. Don't forget for. If you You've been listening to this for two hours and didn't catch the punchline at the very beginning. Ethan, how many hours of streaming did this take? 50. Four, 50. 50. There are 55 zero hours of – and I'm only there for a small fraction. Alex, even a chunk. Yeah, Ethan even soldiers, I. <laughs> Ethan's soldiering this thing on for 50 hours with this seemingly never-ending Word document. And after a while, I'm like, dude, you should have really put page numbers in. He's like, I don't have page numbers. It's an ebook. Uh, we'll deal with it later. But it's so massive and comprehensive in that respect that you're almost left with them turning to Ethan and going, what the hell? What are we going to do with this? Well, uh, I mean, I'm like people have suggested some things like to actually like do a page by page uh, sort of comprehensive stuff on it. But like, I, I, you know, yeah, yeah, annotations. And I'm just 
I, I, I'm not interested in that. I'm working on my own book and all that. You know, it, it takes a lot of effort even just to fix this up so you can understand what I said. <laughs> you know, the, like I, I'm I'm putting in the nouns that I didn't when I was typing it up. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, this, <laughs> so you know, just just to say, I have no ill feelings towards Stephen King, none whatsoever. He he did what what he was going to do. I just think that he went about things very unevenly. I think that he should have thought about, uh, you know, what he was doing in terms of creating a, a volume to, to go out to people and have a history label on it. I think he should have taken the corrections of Zub, which were almost all correct and all relevant. Um, and, but, and, you know, and, Nowadays, as I said in, in a blog post that I did about this, if if this if you want to know the history, I just can't recommend. It. Um, if you are looking into the history, which is a different thing, then you need to read it. Uh, so if you are among our group, you must read Ken uh, because you need to engage with that. If you just want to get started, I cannot I I cannot in good conscience recommend it. Um, not because Again, not because uh, Kent is uh, is a no go zone in, in terms of you know him as an author, but just I I can't pro I I, I yeah that, that that those are my words. You mm -hmm. cannot that, endorse. Yes, sorry. I cannot. I cannot, I endorse, cannot endorse the ultimate the history of video games, either in its original form or of this. I, I'm sure he's going to be very very sad that he doesn't get a blurb from you on the back cover. <laughs> 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 and uh, and also it should, should say I have not finished reading volume two i've read a couple chapters yeah. well you know for me i mean i do owe a great debt to kent i really do because when i first started thinking about doing something with video game history back in you know the mid 2000s the mid aughts my first thought process is process basically was kent does such a good job because i didn't know any better kent does such a good job of doing all of this atari stuff this nintendo stuff the sega stuff this console stuff high score even though it's, it's more of a of a coffee table style book still has some great stories about the beginning of the computer game industry and all of this stuff that kent didn't do what if i did something that kind of combined the knowledge of those two books fleshed it out just a little bit with a couple of other sources and and created something that truly did encompass all of, of video games. You know, that was my starting point. It was a flawed starting point, but it was the start of my journey into learning more about the history, learning more about what actually happened and and putting together the work that I'm doing now. So Kent needs to be called out. Kent needs to be criticized uh, because of some of those errors. But he was at the forefront of a field that didn't even exist. And that means something. So I think the most important thing, which we kind of touched on on the end, is not so much that we, you know, come back and, and continually to the general public point out all the errors of Kent. I mean, I, I enjoy being in this forum and, and doing it sometimes, but it was fun. Uh, absolutely. But I think the important thing is that Kent is an object lesson and and what we need to do we being not just the people here, but just the broader we that are interested in this topic is to create something that supersedes Kent. And I think once that happens, we can just look on Kent as this this quaint, funny and sometimes interesting beginning experiment in into the history of, of this industry. And, and, and he can be that and it'll be OK. We won't have to talk about him in this way anymore. He'll, he'll be he's, he's the he's the first, you know, he's the first rocket in our Kerbal Space Program that that didn't even, <laughs> you know, make it to the launch pad. And once we've finally made it <laughs> off the planet, then, you know, it, it's it's fine. It can be a historical curiosity and and we don't have to to engage with it anymore. And so that's that's where I hope we all. Alex, end where up. else are we going to get our descriptions of how good the food at press events was? <laughs> well, that's that's true. That's true. So so that's that's where I kind of feel it is. I'm, I'm hoping that within the next 10, 15, 20 years, we're to a point that we don't have to have this conversation anymore because because we have moved on. Excellent. Well, I think and uh, with that note, we can uh, close this discussion. Uh, All I'll right. Put some. Uh, <laughs> I was still talking, but OK, yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, I thought you were just doing the no, 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 the synchronization. No. I was okay. just closing the casket. <laughs> Yeah, so I was just going to say I'll try to put uh, references to a lot of this stuff in the show notes. Uh, Ethan, if you do decide to post those 50 hours of uh, footage, we can well, make The footage is already up. That. I'm working on the notes. Oh, it's already up. Okay, then uh, you're going to give me the link to that. I'll put that in the show notes. And I'd like to thank all of you guys for coming in today and sharing your thoughts on this uh, topic, especially because we are all interested in the history of this industry. And uh, like Alex said, this is kind of a cornerstone piece. So it's kind of like, you know, Freud handing out cocaine. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> we moved on. <laughs> <laughs> they seem so happy <laughs> what an analogy well, th thank you Carol for giving us a form of which to uh, express our grief I'm glad that Absolutely. I was able to get everybody uh, here who wanted to talk about this because uh, I feel like me just going off about it was not going to be nearly as fun yeah but no this I was yeah, no, this was a lot of fun. I, I really appreciate being invited in uh, by you, Carl, and, and by you, Ethan, who put out the call uh, to have this discussion because this was great. Yeah. Thrilled to be right. here. For <laughs> <laughs> and you did a wonderful job of it. It was Thank nice you. to finally see your face. Please, okay. please go back and listen to my L. L. Corn. I played L. I played the whole of L. L. Corn. <laughs> yeah, uh, by the way, if you want to be incentivized to listen to the footage, we uh, did oh, impression. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not going to say any more than that. Uh, so yeah, if you if you want to want to check it out, then uh, to to to, to be clear, we did impressions when doing the parts of people, as opposed yes. to doing impressions of people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That is a key distinction. <laughs> so you I'll, I'll turn it turned into Groucho Marx, or what? what people it could have been. It was freeform. It really was freeform. <laughs> AKA you couldn't keep the accent. Some people, going some people you wouldn't have thought had a thick French accent. Strangely did kind of <laughs> a thick French accent. <laughs> worth worth all 50 hours, I have to implore you. Uh, oh man. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, the pandemic's been going on too long. Okay, it's people. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, have fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>